You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with Future Tech Health Podcast. And my guest is uh, Damien Blenkinsop. He's a founder of KetoSource. Website is ketosource.co. And he also runs the Quantified Body Podcast. Very knowledgeable guy. I met him at the uh, Metabolic Health Summit recently. And I saw that he had a uh, continuous glucose monitor stuck to his arm. So he uh, inspired me to get one for myself and my family. And a great guy with a lot of info. So Damien, thanks for coming. Oh, great to be here. Great to meet you too. Yeah, excellent. So tell me about uh, Keto Stores. What what was the reason that uh, you founded it? And what's you know, and, and the Quantified Body Podcast. Like, what's your background? I guess I guess it all comes from data because uh, I was a, a analyst and a strategy consultant early in my career, and I've just was had a data bias and, and try to make decisions that way. And uh, really, I was always interested in health, which is the focus of both of those um, projects. But um, what happened was my interest in that. I was originally interested in all of the longevity stuff. So, you know, ex- life extension and areas like that. Since my early 20s, I kind of felt like it was necessary to uh, live, live as old as possible. So I was already interested in that and working on that. Um, and then and then what happened is I was living, I was doing a, a digital nomad lifestyle, like a four hour work week, and I was you know, living all over the place. And um, I was wow. in Thailand at one point and um, I got extremely ill acutely ill. We had floods there and I also went to an island and got bit by something and you know a whole bunch of stuff happened at the same time and I was like rushed to hospital and um, they couldn't figure it out. A lot of neurological symptoms and all sorts of um, other symptoms actually. It was quite confusing because there was so much going on like I was bouncing between experts in different departments and so because that wasn't able to be fixed like it was confusing everyone after you know, after a while, I stopped bouncing around um, the different departments, and then, you know, I also ended up traveling to the U.S. and places to to you know to try and find better medical help. But you know, basically, I ended up just starting tracking a lot of data on my body to try and figure it out. And I I spent I mean five seven years basically digging myself out of that hole. All of those symptoms. At one point, I was bed bound. Um, had a lot of neurological symptoms. Had atrophy in my brain. You know, so there's all sorts of things I've tracked over time, and um, yeah, and then the brain stuff's really, really quite frightening, especially when you've had a good brain. I was pretty smart, and I, I lost a, you know, faculties that I took for granted. Like I'd never spelled uh, a word wrong in my life. Uh, my grammar, I speak, many, you know, languages, many languages. Um, so I was always really good with all that stuff, and uh, I would be writing emails, and there would be like huge mistakes, and I'd reread them, and there would be words in there that I didn't remember writing, and they didn't fit in the sentences, and very weird stuff wouldn't remember friends' names. You know, there was all sorts of stuff going on and you could see the uh, trophy in the brain also that was tracking with that. But anyway, so basically that forced me uh, to spend a huge amount of time basically learning different things, testing different things and just gathering a lot, spending a lot of time and money on gathering data on my body to fix different things in my body and troubleshoot it and, uh, you know, drag myself back to health. So part of that was the Quantified Body podcast. Um, that was basically a project I fa- project I founded to connect with experts, maybe you know, like you're doing uh, yourself, um, something That's you enjoy. True. So, yep. Yeah. So um, I, you know, that enabled me to connect with a lot of cool people, scientists, 
or pe people who've done self experiments as well. Um, and I was doing it in a lot of areas that I, I felt could be helpful to recovering my health or exploring those areas. And the main focus was data because you know I found there was still a lot of opinion around and it and it and at the beginning and when I got ill it, it sent me around in circles um, you know like I got bounced between different departments in the hospital and things like that and I didn't have a lot of data on the situation they were you know it was just kind of based on judgment and so I ended up saying look I'm not doing anything on on this app data and I came from my background as well I've been a strategy analyst so you know when I was advising companies everything was based on data. So it was just natural for me to uh, fall back on that, and then the podcast was founded on that. And yeah, my, and, and um, source, my yeah. quick thing is, you know, I realize at least personally, and I'm sure you agree, you have to be a real advocate for your own health. You have to assemble yeah. all your own data and maybe talk to multiple doctors and piece it together because otherwise, you know, at best, it's like the blind men touching the elephant. You always get second and third opinions. I mean, that, that's what I always tell my, you know, my parents, my family, people like that. You know, you can never rely on one opinion for anything. And then, you, like I say, like people making decisions in businesses and, and in other areas when they're trying to be careful, they always get second and third opinions. Um, actually, yeah, I don't know if you know Ray Dalio. You read his books? Yeah, Principal. he's great. He's really great. Yeah. So he actually talks about a similar, like, well, a cancer diagnosis he got and he I think he went and got four different opinions very very different very different uh, very divergent you know and he, he made a very different decision once he collected all the data from different places so it's definitely something you have to do for one thing with you know with um with the medical world I mean you know I've I've had my own stuff I guess first of all it's expensive to get different opinions second of all there's all these silos you know you um you want to know who's a good surgeon for x well you call and it's hard to, you know, you usually can't even talk to the person. So how do you find out who's good and who's knowledgeable in X, Y, or Z? Then you get a pain for the consult. Then if you need to get another biopsy or another MRI, for instance, who wants to do that? So the whole thing seems to conspire to make, um, you know, getting multiple opinions and multiple tests in the medical world difficult, especially if you've got a serious condition. Then there's your mental state, the fear of, you know, the results of the test. So kudos for you for doing that, but it just seems very difficult. Yeah, I mean, like I had no choice. It was survival. So, you know, I guess I get, you know, I've had, I had a good standard of living and I enjoyed a very good life. I traveled a lot. Um, I'd done a lot of things I loved. And one of the ways I look at it, because there's other people that I know that have got dragged down uh, similarly, but haven't managed to drag themselves back up. Um, and part of it, I think, is that I, I was clinging to my previous standard of life and I refused to like give that up and accept something lesser and I can be pretty damn stubborn um so that just meant I spent a hell of a lot of time and I was very persistent and I went through the opinions and and there's a lot of bureaucracy I think you're also like referring you know referring to that there's a lot of bureaucracy you have to push through to to get tests and all that stuff it's not not like freely accessible information yet but um there are way, ways around that o over time you figure it out um, and it gets easier and easier to get your labs. Like now I can just walk down the road and get, get labs and then, you know, I can talk directly with companies. Uh, and it, you know, it gets easier once you've been around for a while and you, you, you know how it works. So, you know, but well, any first, tips for listeners on what they can do if they're in situations? If, if you're in a situation where you need different opinions or you do need different tests. Yeah, both labs, opinions, et cetera. Any tips on how to make things, you know, navigate the medical system more efficiently? Yeah, well, there are there are self serve companies now. Depending on where you are based, they exist in the U.S. They, there's a few also in the U.K. A, an even better way is to maybe set up a. You can make a friend who's a physician who can help you out. These were some of the hacks I, you know, did early on, and um, you can work closely with one physician who who's really bought into your problem and helping you solve it as well. You know, so I've got some you know close physician partners I've worked worked on throughout this period. And I, you know, I tend to, I, I bounce around to a lot of different specialists because what I found is, you mentioned it, there's a lot of silos going on. Now, the problem with everyone's mind is we, you know, once we get into a topic, we start seeing it everywhere because you've spent so much mm -hmm. time, you know, you've invested so much time in that subject. So, you know, I don't, I don't find any one person is going to solve all your problems. I feel like it's multifactorial. So I, I do, you know, I just look for the best people in each area and I, I keep going. I mean, that's one of the that's one of the things I've done. I just kept kept on going. If something didn't work, I'd move on to the next thing and look at that. And I tried to work on different systems of the body. 
and you know get some kind of base data to to understand where they are and if it's worth working on that for a while. I, I guess one of the big principles I also like that helped me early on was I looked for physicians that had a lot of data and talked about it. So if you have um, physicians with very big practices um, and they've seen a lot of people and they they like to test, they they have likely you know basically they're sitting on this part of data and they and if they also, if you know they're also kind of data orientated, they they must have learned quite a bit from that. So I did also target people who were more data driven and had large sets of data. I felt um, so that you know I could basically be leveraging that knowledge and that data that they'd built up over time. How do you know if um, someone has a large repository of data or if they're data driven? Do you look at their website or do you, you know, how do you figure that out about a medical professional? Well, you can see through their like testing strategy. So like um, some 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 physicians will basically have a set of tests that everyone does when they join so it's, it's like a default um and then you know a lot of the people i've ended up with are quite outspoken they're at conferences uh sometimes they're presenting research so they're involved that way and you know so those are the people i've been able to identify if there's other good people and they're not as you know visible um they've just got their practice and, and they're not showing i haven't found them you know so i wouldn't know um but so so we I'm often coming across the people who, who will talk at conferences about their data. Um, you know, you often, like, if, if they're really interested in it, they'll often, often go to uh, conferences and want to talk about it or even get involved in studies. Okay. And I kind of took you off track, but let's, let's get back to uh, Keto Source. So the podcast, I know you wanted to find experts and interview them. You know, <laughs> I do the same. But what, um, what is Keto Source about and what was your reasoning for creating that? So Keto Source is basically derived from the Quantified Body because um, if, you, if you look at my podcast, you'll see that I did quite a few experiments uh, many years ago with fasting, in particular different types of fasting diets. And I, you know, so I did episodes on those because when, when I when I do an experiment and track labs and stuff, I'll publish it. And, and so they, it was a tool that I found to be very beneficial um, in in various ways. Um, the, the fasting cycles, FMD, or fast mimicking diet cycles. I, the fasting itself seemed to be quite beneficial. The ketogenic diet, I had a lot of inflammation. I was in a lot of pain. And um, when I switched to the ketogenic diet, that relieved a lot of that. And it helped with my brain symptoms as well, uh, brain symptoms as well. So basically what happened is when, when I did, when I, I was searching for these tools, like the ketogenic diet and fasting and, and this whole area of ketone metabolism became, you know, one of the best tools that I found. And so ketosols naturally came out of that because I just saw it as something that could have great impact at the time. You know, there, there was research coming out. Dom D'Agostino was talking about it a lot. I, he was one of the guys I interviewed, uh, Seyfried as well. You know, but but I just, I, and I returned to the UK. I'd been in the US and um, there was nothing here. So I couldn't access even, you know, the most basic keto like supplements or the keto foods even. Um, so the company basically got set up just to, you know, just because it was my interest. It was actually something I needed um, to, you know, function and manage my symptoms. And it just grew from there because there were so many people that were getting help. Uh, when, when you have a, a keto company and, you know, I talk a lot to, to my customers and my clients and I built up a, a practice with PhD students, nutritionists and, and PhDs now. Um, you know, working in this field and, and they're studying in this field and we're working with clients and um, you, you see the benefits to people. And so it's, it's just something, it sucks you in because you're like, wow, this, this, is, this is something real that's really working for people. Um, and it's great to work in a, you know, area like that. It's, you know, it's kind of like your dream, you know, when you're, you know, if, if you're looking for a yeah. business, if you're looking for something you want to do, I mean, the sweet spot is something that you really feel like you're having an impact on the world. Yeah, I feel like it was, you know, meaning you helped me because you introduced me to the continuous glucose monitors and gave a lot of great tips. So it makes a lot of sense. Um, were you able to fix your condition or even put a name to the condition that you got in Thailand? So, well, I, I think it's multifactorial. No, I, I mean, I don't, in a, in a sense, I don't know if I still believe in the single condition idea because I've fixed so many different things and I've had like gains along the way. You know, I've had gains over the last year. I'm still improving. You know, my brain is uh, recovered. Like if, if I look at the latest brain reports I got, uh, I get, you get an MRI, it's called NeuroQuant. Um, it's a benchmarking tool. See if there's a trophy in your brain, they use it for cognitive decline and, and things like that. And basically benchmarks you uh, for age against healthy controls versus Alzheimer's versus mild cognitive decline. And, you know, mine's like completely recovered. 
um, which is quite fantastic over four years ago where, you know, I'd mapped out uh, the damage and the atrophy. Um, you know, I'm still, but I'm still working on it because there's still like certain pains and, and other symptoms uh, I get. And I don't know if I'll ever stop actually, because it, it's really interesting as well. Just, to, you know, keep on exploring your body. I mean, you know, your body is, you know, something you live in all the time. And it, and it's, I get, it's, it's become a hobby for me as well. I mean, that's kind of what the quantified body is. I'm always doing experiments, you know, um, looking at different things. And I do find that, you know, I, I manage to optimize different things and it improves the quality of my life. Um, so, you know, whether it's sleep, uh, whether it's energy levels, like I've had really big gains in energy levels the last year and also like maintaining focus. So it's, it has a lot of productivity impacts, you know, so I can work long days now. And, you know, some, sometimes on Mondays, because I have a lot of meetings, I'll work 12, 14 hours and maybe 12, 12 hours straight where it's nearly back to back meetings. And I, I feel like it can focus, uh, which is definitely something that even before I got, got into trouble in Thailand, um, wasn't possible. In fact, you know, I, I remember I used to zone out and um, it just, I wasn't like that at all, even though I was younger. So, no, I don't think it's something you let go of once you've learned a lot and you've, and you've learned to take control of your body. Once, once you learn to take control of your body and, and start improving it, you know, I think it's something I'm going to be interested in for a while. And I'm still interested in all the life extension stuff. I don't know if you've got into that part, but I, I go into the, I go to the uh, conferences there and, you know, I do believe that the technologies are going to be coming along pretty soon, which are going to enable us to extend our lives. So that's still an interest area for me. Well, you put out a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of uh, interesting, you know, partial answers so far. So, you know, what are some examples of things you've done to improve your brain function that you felt worked you know, and then maybe we'll talk about some life extension stuff. You know, like I know there's way too many things to cover, but, you know, what are some uh, things you've done that really made a big difference to yourself? Yeah, so this bit's tricky because I mapped that um, improvement in my brain over four years. And I wasn't in a position where I could do one thing, you know, <laughs> a control and then not do anything. Um, and then, you know, um, get my brain scan. I was in a place where I need my brain back and, you know, I want to feel great. Uh, so I've just done a lot of things, but I can tell you like theoretically, anecdotally where I feel um, the gains have been. Um, but you know, so the ketogenic diet and the fasting cycles are periods where I noticed, you know, the gains. Um, and, you know, I still notice if I go off a ketogenic diet, I don't, you know, but now and again, for a day or something, you know, I have lower energy. I just, I just don't feel as good and I get more inflammation. So that, that's definitely key for me. But I don't know if that would be the same for everyone because not everyone has a, the same inflammation as I do. Um, something well, else which a, I've been a, doing. A, a good short disclaimer is, you know, you're not a clinical trial and you're just one person. And, you know, I understand that. So yeah, you know, as a disclaimer to listeners, and there's, there's factors can influence other factors. But still, it's, you know, we'd like to hear and see what, uh, what you have to say, what you experienced. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, there is there is some, you know, some research studies looking at the anti-inflammatory mechanisms. There's no, there's no uh, human studies or anything, um, but it, it's an interesting area of research. Um, so, you know, I tell people to, if they're interested in it, you could like test the ketogenic diet. So this is often what we do with clients, you know, you say, look, it's an experiment, you know, um, and what you should do is raise your, you know, your ketone levels above three, maybe above four um, to get a clear signal and do that for a couple of weeks and see if it's affecting your inflammation positively. You know, it really is an experiment. And then you go off completely, you know, go back on a carb diet um, and then have a diary and, and make notes and, and see if you notice a difference. Um, you know, that's where we are. It's not, not a clear science, but, you know, sometimes it's on off uh, approach, like do it for two weeks, stop it for two weeks, do it again for two weeks and keep a diary can give you a clear signal indicator whether something's useful to you or not. Um, so uh, the, the thing I've done over the last year is um, sauna, dry sauna. So um, it's basically just sweating. You know, so I've been going like uh, maybe five times a week on average. Um, and I've tracked how much I've sweated, sweated out. So it's uh, it's about 100 liters now. Um, over you haven't, over you haven't collected the sweat in like bottles, have you? <laughs> <laughs> so... So do you know what they did in the studies? I mean, what you have to do, like whenever you want to figure something like this out, you look at the studies and what they did and they put you in big plastic bags, um, you know, to collect all the sweat um, so that they can weigh it. Um, the other way they did it, and I found another study, which is far simpler, is that you just weigh yourself before you go in and then you weigh yourself afterwards. And there's That's a difference. Better, 
yeah, it's way simpler. So I was like, phew, that, that, that's uh, feasible. So I've been able to do that um, the whole time. It's just interesting. Um, but it, is, it varies as well. That's kind of interesting. I, th I think it, it seems to anecdotally um, vary with stress. So when I'm more stressed and sleep deprived, I seem to sweat less. But, you know, it's just, just something interesting. Um, what um, are but the that, effects you know, on you from the sauna? I seem to have had really good energy gains. So I went and saw my physician last month. He's in California, so I don't, I, I don't see him that often. Um, so I haven't caught up with him for a while, and we discussed this. You know, I discussed him the sauna project with him, and we'd run through it. And he'd actually had a few, a few of his patients who had done kind of intense sauna for a while, and and uh, had seen some upside to it. So you know, I was like, all right, well, I'm going to do this test. And um, actually, there's a course I looked into because there's a lot, there's a lot of uh, fluffy stuff about saunas as well out there. Um, but um, there's a guy called Brian Walsh. I don't know if you've come across him. Um, but he likes to read a lot of yeah. research and, and uh, create courses for physicians. So I, you, you know, I see him at conferences uh, quite a bit. So I went through his course, and it's quite it's it's nice because it, he's looking at real research papers um, and evidence for you know metals coming out in the sweat, for pesticides coming out in the sweat, and then talking about you know these things are in our body. What could they potentially be doing? You know, at what levels do we have them? Um, you know, so I don't know why, but like you know, I have over the year, uh, last year, and my physician noticed you know the clear difference in um, uh, some not my labs, but um, we do pre-screen surveys. You know, they have for there are scientifically validated surveys you can do just on where you are, and so every time I go to see him, he has me take those, and there was a real, really clear difference um, from the last time I saw him a year ago, um, and I'm feeling much better. You know, um, so I think sauna has got something. And um, I've noticed also that I seem to be more creative when I'm in there. So I read and take notes in there. Um, so it's kind of productive time for me anyway, um, which is why I enjoy it because it's like space. Like it's the one time I get to spend some time on my own. Um, so I guess, you know, I've been able to combine it like that. But I do find I come out with a better mood. And if you look at Rhonda Patrick's, like um, she, she's big into saunas as well from um, Found My Fitness Podcast. And she's done some really, you know, quite detailed episodes on it and uh, linked to studies and stuff, you know, so there's, it, okay. you know, there's some, some interesting stuff around there about mood and, uh, and other things. So I seem to have experienced that as well. Well, quick question on the, on the pre-screening or the, the tests, any markers of yours that particularly changed a lot? Yeah. So I tried to do as many, uh, it's, for me, it's an experiment. So like I tried to do a lot, but it's very hard to like track things like metals and stuff in your body, because if, if you're looking at like urine, that's basically an output. So say one of your uh, detoxification systems, so you have different phases and enzymes and, and, and um, these are all helping to convert things to allow them to get flushed out of your body. Now, if those are not working properly, you're going to have low amounts. And, and then, you know, some, some people are going to say, oh, you don't have a lot in your urine, so you don't have a lot in your body. Or you don't have a lot in your blood, so you don't have a lot in your body. But it depends on where it gets stuck, potentially, right? Um, so the most interesting one I got was a fat biopsy because you're trying to get at the actual burden, which is tissues, cells. Um, so I had just a fat biopsy. It was the best thing I could find. And I halved my volatile organic compounds over that nine-month period. So you know, I felt that was like, yeah, that's not a bad result. Um, now, I've done the urine and the other tests. And... Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm going to actually have to dig into the data and stuff, but I don't, as, you know, because of the detoxification issues um, and uh, basically the variables involved in that, I'm not so um, kind of interested in it. Um, I've also got some data. I was on a ketogenic diet because, um, and then I did a, actually a carb diet for one day and did some more urine tests because one of my hypotheses is that when you're on a ketogenic diet or you're fasting, you've got lipolysis taking place and you're breaking down fat cells and you're releasing some of these toxins, right? It could be metals, pesticides, because I'm on a fat, fat soluble. Mm. Um, but if you're on a carb diet, they're not getting broken down as much. So, you know, again, that's a potential like confounder. So it's just interesting stuff. I got to look for the data um, and see, but the only thing I'd, yeah, as I say, I think the fat biopsy is the only real thing that's a little bit useful. Yeah, that's weird. You know, a lot of people talk about the ketogenic diet being protective of various things. You know, let's say when you get chemo or radiation, et cetera. I wonder, based on your theory, if a carb diet for a day or two would be protective after doing an intense sauna period. You know, you've liberated a lot of stuff out of your body. Maybe you want it to be quiet for a little while in terms of what the fat holds. So maybe you go on a carb diet for a few days to actually protect 
yourself and give you respite from uh, from what's come out of you, and then go back to a uh, you know a ketogenic diet. Yeah, potentially. And I think you know, like some people who maybe go on a ketogenic diet or or they do a fast and they get ill. They, I, you know, because we're talking to populations which are on keto diets and um, fasting. You know, doing lots of fasting and stuff. We hear these. We, we get these people who who can't fast or you know who have problems with the ketogenic diet and potentially, you know, they've got some fat soluble toxins that they've got stored up in their high levels and, you know, releases a lot when they go on the diet. You know, it's just, I think the body is so complicated. These are the interesting things, the questions, but how do you answer them? I don't know. We're not there yet. Maybe that's where the keto flu comes from for some people. Is there really yeah, absolutely. Of, uh, especially the headaches. I, I thought in particular about the headaches and stuff. People get more, and the, the um, people get these itches and stuff on their skin, you know, like uh, those kind of symptoms. They seem more you know, uh, representative toxicity sometimes. What, what kind of experimentation have you done with exogenous ketones? They've, I've spoken to a lot of people about them, but I don't know, people seem shy about saying much about them, you know, what they've done and what they've experimented with. Yeah, so, I mean, so my company's done a lot of uh, track uh, experimenting with them. We've written up research on it because we were interested in uh, understanding the, the esters versus the salts versus the C8 and, you know, basically understanding, the, you know, the the ketone um, boosting effects of those, um, you know, just to kind of lay that lay that out. Um, so I've done a lot of that in the past as well. So, you know, the salts and the esters go up quick and, and they come down quicker. The CH really slow to go up and then, you know, and it's slow to go down. But they're, they're different profiles uh, from that perspective. And this is anecdotal, but, you know, what, I, what the two things I use for the, the ketone salts for um, and, and specifically, I use Keto Canna just because that one has, has worked historically for me. And so I just stick to it. And yeah, there was a few studies at the beginning, at least done on that one uh, versus some of the others, which you don't and you don't really know where they come from as well. Um, so the, the Keto Canna for me seems to help to suppress inflammation as well. But I don't really know how it's how it may be doing it. Um, it's just it's just an interesting thing. Like I I've been in situations where I've had higher inflammation and I've taken taken it and it seemed to help suppress. Um, you, you know, there's the racemic arm argument about uh, you know the the ketone salts um, that they they have two sides and you know one's not getting metabolized properly. Well, maybe that other one's doing something, or maybe it's mm. the salt content mm. in there that is somehow doing something to my body. But I don't know. But you know, I carry keto kind of around with me. Um, and if I have one of these, you know, these times where I'm more inflamed and it could it can get triggered by, you know, jet lag, um, you know, lack of sleep and other things like that, you know, I keep it around because it helps. Um, and at first you, I wasn't how sure. How do you tell if you're inflamed? Is it a feeling? Do you feel bloated or you just, like, how do you know? No, no. For, for me, uh, I have, I have like burning all up my spine. Um, so oh, yeah. it's. Yeah, I can, I can get more than that. So it's, 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 it's pain for me. So it's quite noticeable. I can get pain in my hands as well. Um, um, yeah, so it's quite a clear signal for me. You know, I know for other people, it's uh, a little bit more subtle. Yeah, when I spoke to Dom D'Agostino, he, he said one thing, you know, probably possibly to try is, uh, you know, have um, ketone salts and then also have uh, MCT oil, you know, the C8, mix them together. So you change the profile of, of absorption so it may last you longer. Is one suggestion. Yeah, so so I I do that all the time actually. Um, uh, yeah, so I mean that that's kind of my preferred route, and and also because it kind of gives you this like longer profile, like I was saying, the C8 lasts longer. Um, so yeah. But have you have you run across people, let's say that you know have this this uh, have ketones or ketones plus a C8 mixture before every meal or after every meal or you know, or what, what kind of experiments do you see out there with exogenous ketones and, you know, what kind of anecdotal reports do you hear? You know, I, I, I mean, I was just talking to a guy earlier who's tested using them before sleep because he's having sleep issues. Um, they didn't seem to help. They seem to do the opposite. And I've actually got quite a few data points from that. So, you know, if taking ketone salts before you go to sleep doesn't seem to be a good idea. And for some people also, not, not everyone, C8, um, late at night isn't helpful either. It'll keep you awake. Um, mm. You know, so, so those are two points. And there's some people out there saying, you know, like maybe ketone esters can be helpful to sleep. I, I don't know. Right? Um, I, I haven't tried that. I took a ketone ester on the plane on the way back from my metabolic health summit just for, uh, for fun with my team. <laughs> um, uh, we were like, well, let's do. Um, I fell asleep the whole way and I had a great sleep. So <laughs> I don't know. 
but I was really beat. I mean, it was a busy, it was a busy conference, right? So, you know, I don't, I don't think it's correlated. I think it's just, yeah, I don't know. Okay. Um, what other areas of uh, experimentation do you have interesting anecdotes? Maybe fasting schedules, um, you know, uh, hyperbaric oxygen. I feel like you, you know a little bit about everything. That's just my guess. So that's why I ask. Yeah, I like because I've basically tried a lot of different things. Um, I did hyperbaric for three months, maybe four months actually. Um, so it's one of these soft chambers because uh, you can have it in your house. So it's like really convenient. You can just sit in there twice a day. Uh, you can work, you know. Um, so that I mean, often the accessibility makes a difference um, to using something. Um, if I had to go to a hyperbaric you know, chamber down the road, I wouldn't do it. Uh, the reason I can, I go to dry sauna is because it's basically downstairs in a gym. Um, you know, so I, I always think about convenience for these things. That's what really makes it work. So you can, um, if it's not a habit, it's not going to change your life, right? If you're not doing it every day or, you know, if you're not doing it consistently, like hardly any of these things are going to have much of an impact. Now the hyperbaric, I don't feel like it had, uh, a very big impact. I was tracking some markers. I don't know if they were the right ones now looking back at it. Um, and um, I sp- I've spoken a bit with a guy called Scott Scher. Um, actually, I spoke to him at the Metabolic Health Summit. Uh, I interviewed him um, there, but I've known him for a while. I've consulted with him talking about it. And, um, you know, for me, I don't think it was uh, the right thing. Um, might be beneficial, you know, in specific scenarios as a fair bit of research. But it, for me, it wasn't, didn't really seem to do anything. So, and it's quite expensive. Okay. Um, so, so that wasn't. Yeah, a great use of time. I think ultimate, ultimately. And you mentioned fasting cycles. Um, you know, intermittent fasting is pretty hot. Did you find that uh, you would do it for 24 hours, 16 hours? I mean, what did you experiment with, and what kind of effects did you see? So I'm more into the prolonged fast. Um, I did intermittent fasting many, many years ago. Uh, for me, I, I did find it hard to maintain my weight with intermittent fasting because of the small eating window, and I would get really full. Uh, so that was just me. But um. Prolonged fasts, uh, I've done the water fast uh, up to 10 days, and um, then I started doing the fast mimicking diet, which I now prefer because I feel like um, me and everyone else, so I, I get my mom actually to do the fast mimicking diet, and, and most people, like if people come to us and they want to do um, fast, we, we normally say, look, like frankly, we think you get the same benefits from the fast mimicking diet, um, and you know it's slightly less stressful. Um, so, you know, and given that, well, a lot of these people also are like, they, they tend to be doing a lot as, as well. So, you know, maybe they're not sleeping great. Uh, maybe they're trying to work out a lot. Maybe they've got a busy life. Maybe they've got kids. Um, so I think everyone, you know, got reasonable levels of stress these days. So I just think it's better to do the fast mimicking diet. I've tracked the markers and stuff and I'm, I feel like it, you know, it's, it's pretty close to the same effects you're getting with a fast. So, um, great. I think it's, I think it's better to do that personally, and so I do that sometimes for five days, and I'll. But I, but I just do a, a more convenient version for me and a dumbed down one. Um, so I just looked at the macros uh, and um, that he's using, um, and I just eat guacamole twice a day um, and take a micronutrient powder um, yes. to get a broad spectrum of micronutrients, and I just eat that, you know, the five days to keep it simple. You make it sound easy, but uh, have you seen? What's easier? Is very difficult <laughs> for people, or? Yeah, it well, is. any, any I mean, testing at all seems pretty hard, you know. But you know, yeah, what's your experience with with how people do it successfully. Well, I, I find that the psychological battle is the hardest part, and then they get um and and I, if they haven't been on a ketogenic diet, like I would actually recommend someone do a ketogenic diet first because the symptoms you get seem to be a lot lesser. Because like the people I know who've had the worst symptoms t- tend to have not done a ketogenic diet or any intermittent fasting or anything, and and then they, you know, I mean, they talk about you. They'll tell you they're having dreams about food and they've got headaches. Uh, I, I think sometimes, uh, quite often, the headaches are actually due to caffeine withdrawal if you stop that at the same time as you stop coffee. Um, but, you know, they, they tend to talk about it in a much more extreme way and, and have a rougher experience, whereas the keto people, you know, seem to uh, get, get through it a lot easily. Um, I've, I've tracked, like, in the experiments, metabolic flexibility increasing with each fast so basically you flip into ketones quicker um so you know like when i first started i think it was like day three my ketones spiked and really got into the high range over five um but um that that basically it, with each fast it moved uh, back uh to the front of the fast so by the end it was like one and a half days or something you know it's, it's i'm already getting a big spike so you can imagine right basically ketones are energy 
your body is, you know, kicking up that energy, it's accessible then. And then, you know, and then you find that, you know, the fast is quite comfortable. It's, it's, it's quite easy to do. So I think it gets easier the more you do it. But really, for most people, it's a psychological battle um, of, you know, just this idea of not eating that, you know, I think they just don't want to do it. And they've heard stories in the media or on the internet and stuff. And even my mom, she's around me a lot. She, uh, you know, she's, and she's done quite a few of the fast smoking diets now. Um, she's still you know, really resistant, especially when she reads something, you know, um, about it or something like that. So I think that's like where most people are. There's still a psychological fear of it. Mm. No, it makes sense. I mean, I feel the same thing too. It's uh, yeah, you feel afraid like you're going to hurt yourself or do something wrong. Well, and it also feels where like your your um your legs kind of feel like you have slightly less control over them. So the first time I was careful I wouldn't walk too far from my house and stuff. I you know, I was kind of taking it easy. Um but then the last 10 day water fast I did, I I I went all around town. I did every I worked, I did everything because you you know, but you feel like you your your legs are just a little bit more wobbly. You haven't as much control over them. You have to think a little bit more about where you're walking and things like that. So it's 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 kind of an amusing sensation, like an adventure as well. Um, once, once you realize it's not dangerous, um, you know, I think it's it's kind of interesting um, and maybe worth experiencing at least once. Well, the weird thing is, too, is, you know, there's so much time spent on looking for food, going to eat food, et cetera. I mean, you know, you tend to have so much free time, you kind of don't know what to yeah. do with yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's actually great for working, I've found. Like, if you've got a lot of work on, and I find... I've mentioned this before, like when you fast, you, you, you do slow down. So I've tracked markers in hormones and stuff, your testosterone crashes, things like that. And you definitely feel like very different. I remember one time I was like, you know, you know, basically talking to a girl, like, you know, uh, th- you know, thinking like, you know, kind of pursuing her a bit. Uh, and I did a fast and then the, my interest just vanished after like day two. And I, you know, I stopped texting so much and, uh, became more meditative and kind of long-term thinking. And, you know, I, I often find that when I'm fasting, um, like, you know, I'm more interested in reading, I've uh, got more time for reading, just everything kind of slows down a bit. And I, so I sometimes I think it's worth doing once in a while because we're rushing around all the time and sometimes we're not thinking about our lives and where we're going and what's important. And um, a fast, I think, can be a way to get to the other side um, and, and think a little bit more slowly and get a different perspective. So it's, it's kind of like a nice, nice contrast. That makes sense. Hmm. So, um, you know, I've been asking about all these experiments, but uh, I want to ask you a little bit about Ketosaurus because, you know, I've already sucked up so much time. We're getting close to the end. W- what are the main things that Ketosaurus provides and then what's on the, the roster for like the coming year? What are you going to be doing with Ketosaurus? So I, I think you saw the, the conference. Um, we were at the conference with an idea, which was uh, Keto Experiments. Um, so, uh, what we've been doing is, um, the, the people have a ton of questions about keto and it's getting bigger, right? Every year. Um, and there's a lot of practical questions. Uh, it could be like, you know, it, it's, it's things like what alcohol should I take? Or it's like, you know, the, uh, ketone, um, the ketone, the exogenous ketones, like what are they actually doing to my body? When should I take them? What does research say? Um, We've been uh, doing reviews of research to kind of get some ideas on what practical suggestions might be for people. And then and then what we do is we do um, experiments to try and clarify some of the bits. And they're not like large experiments, but, um, you know, we have an internal team and they'll do experiments and equals two, three. Um, and then we've got a community um, here in London and, and um, we did an experiment in December where, like, you know, we tested 10 people live and it was kind of like an event. So we've been doing, we're exploring this, this uh this this topic to try and bring more clarity uh to some of the topics which are more practical we're interested in publishing studies around it um and uh you know we we learn a lot from it so we're learning a lot about ketone metabolism we're learning a lot about what what foods are ketogenic versus not and um i think i think we need a lot to do a lot more work there um to understand that because it's it's personal for people it's different we see variation when we're testing people and uh, we also see variation based on, you know, the, the simple guidelines of macros and things like that. Um, and, and there are studies and, you know, there's work on this as well. If, if you saw the continuous glucose monitor uh, work by the, the Segal, uh, Aaron Segal, uh, a few years back, I interviewed him on my podcast. And, you know, they were looking at different people and the responses they had to different foods and they were different, you know. And mm-hmm. so they, would, they, started, they started looking at the microbiome. That was their thing. And um, they differentiated people based on the microbiome. 
right? So that's one interesting, you know, variable. I'm sure there's, well, we think there's many others. Uh, we definitely, like I, I've had statistically significant results with sleep. Um, so you can eat a food and it can be ketogenic. And if you are sleep deprived, it won't be ketogenic, which is interesting. I don't know why, but we've seen that enough. And I ran it in 31 people uh, about a couple of years back um, with a, you know, a, a, a bar that I developed, which is ketogenic. It's been tested so much. But with the sleep deprived people, they would get a slight bump in glucose and a slight decrease in, in ketones where everyone else is getting the opposite. So you know, I don't know if that's uh, glucose dysregulation, what's going on there, but um, it, it kind of makes you. So this has made us focus more on sleep. You know, when we're talking with clients and um, with people in general, we're like, okay, so, you know, you're having trouble with your keto diet. How's your sleep? Um, and, you know, I, I think it's a really important piece. Um, and, you know, obviously it's, it's always the piece people don't want to work on the sleep or that, you know, they got more resistance to, unfortunately it seems to be really, really important. Um, so that, that's one of the, that's, this, this is the kind of stuff we're working on. Um, and, uh, we're really interested in, you know, starting to publish research studies. I, you know, I have PhD students and, um, PhD. So they're, they're interested in, in publishing more of this and, and getting more of it out there. So that's one of the things we're, we're really focused on. And that's why we went to, you know, when we went to a metabolic health summit. Um, that was that was the main thing we were doing there. Um, I have you know okay. products in the business as well. You know it 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 all kind of goes together. I just try to develop the best, most ketogenic um, products that I can, so that people can get the benefits of ketone metabolism. Um, so you know we do a, a when we have a product, we just do a lot of testing with it to make sure it does what it says it's going to do. Well, that's great. So you know we're kind of at the end of time. What are some resources for listeners? I mean, it sounds like your podcast, which I don't mind recommending people to because anyone listening to this is going to be an information uh, gatherer big time. So the name of your podcast again, where people can find it. What's that? Yeah. The quantified body, um, which is at the quantified body.net or it's on iTunes, the quantified body. Okay. And then keto source.co is the website yeah. for all other keto source referrals. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. All right. Well, that's great. I mean, there's so much more to ask you, but, um, you know, we're out of time, but I think this is a good start. So Damien, I appreciate you coming on the podcast. Yeah. Thanks for the time. It's been great talking to you. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, but we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials, or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription, or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.